Heavenly Father, you will just now as we have parts in the service, give us the word to speak. Bless our pastor here. Bless him in all things he does for us. Be with the church here today. And uh, when he has different needs, you know who they are. Together. Glorious Father, we thank you today for your might in our life. You are not weak, you are not small, and you are not tired. And we are so grateful that you have carried us through this last week. You've comforted us, you've strengthened us, you've given us hope and courage. And now we come together, Lord, on the Sabbath day to worship you as you are deserving. And Father, I pray that you are smiling in heaven. We want you to know that you are welcome here. This is your church. This is your worship. We're here today to honor you for what you have done. You have made us and you have saved us. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Please be with each one here in a very special way. And for those that aren't here, Lord, give them a Sabbath day's blessing and an extra portion of your spirit. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hymn number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Everlasting arms. 
Sounded wonderful. Please be seated. Our offering this morning is for religious liberty. And as we all know, this Adventist church has, down through the ages, supported religious liberty. And um, the main thing we do when we get these funds on this Sabbath is we... Uh, they go to send the magazine, Liberty Magazine, to all of our thought leaders in the community. And uh, so this is a, where we get to spread the good news of what we do. Um, and it might be good to be aware, I don't know if anybody else is watching the news, but the Sunday laws are creeping across Europe right now. That's right. So it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this puts it before the people that there is a reason not to have Sunday laws. Will the deacons please wait upon us at this time? <clears throat> Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the many ways that you've blessed us. We would ask that you bless these monies as they go back to support the church and to spread the good news and educate people about our religious liberty. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. And now we have the children's story, and Phyllis is going to entertain us today. <laughs> uh, the children will come around with baskets, and we have we the, this little offering that the children take up goes to support our local radio station KOPJ. Uh, keep on praising Jesus. And we also support the Thunbergs in Thailand, the mission, our missionary couple. So it all goes Amen. to help.
Here you go, Phyllis. I got you. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, it's really cold out this morning, isn't it? Yeah, so be... It is <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. And do you wear mittens? Yes. Because you, it's cold outside. <laughs> Well, this morning I want to tell you a story about a man and a woman that were living in a big city. And all they saw was cars and streets and sidewalks and a lot of people just busy, busy all over the place. And, and they just did not, they were not happy. And so they said, well, what should we do? And they decided they wanted to move. And so they said, well, where are we going to move to? And so they said, well, what kind of things do we like? So they were talking to each other, and they said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, you can hold it for you, the mic. Yeah. So they said, well, I like. I like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, it's good. Okay, then this one is, this one is a loon. Okay, the other one really was too, but this is okay. And look at the beautiful lake. Isn't that a beautiful lake? And they, yeah. <laughs> and they want, that's what they wanted. Then they were saying, what else did they want? Deer. They want, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, in my story, I don't think they ate the deer, but they fed them. <laughs> and, and the daddy went out and they, he went out and he cut pine needles down, the, sh the smaller pine stems, and he, he br cut them down so the deer could reach them, and he fed them from the trees in the forest. And then, what is this? I don't know, that another deer, but it's turning its butt in a pig. Yeah, well, that's not, that's another deer that's facing the other direction. He's behind the tree. He's a daddy. Yeah. And, and this is in a dark forest, isn't it? It's getting nighttime there. And what else did they say they liked? Yeah, they wanted a garden, didn't they? Not at town, they couldn't have a garden because they were in just a big building with lots of rooms and no garden space. They wanted a garden, eat out of their own garden. Okay. So then they started looking for a place where they could go. And they decided that they wanted to go way up in north, and they went in, they went in northern Minnesota in our state, but they, they went way up north in the woods. And when they did, and when they did, they found a cabin. I am going to show you the cabin that they bought, okay? Anyway, that's where they moved to. And um, so then they got in their cabin and when they got in their cabin, they started putting their things away. 
and they had this they had this dresser in their bedroom and and they put in what do you think they put in the one drawer they put some towels in there and then they put some sheets in there see here's the sheets in there yeah so anyway one day she went in the, the mother went in and she went to get a towel out of here and when she did here's what she found in that drawer what is it a mouse, a mouse was in that drawer <laughs> yeah well that's the best I could do <laughs> everything's got flowers in my house <laughs> So then she went in and she was going to get some sheets out of the next drawer. And here's the sheets. And there that mouse had been. And so she said, I have to get rid of those mice. Well, the dad said, well, what should I do? Should I go to town and get some poison? And she said, oh, no, honey. We, we don't kill things like that, no. Well, if that's what you're going to do, he said, so how do you plan to take, get rid of these mice? She said, I have an idea. So they prayed about it. Dear Jesus, help us get rid of these mice. <laughs> and then she came up with an idea. And every night before she went to bed, she put out a pie pan and she put some corn in there. See it? Okay, whoa. That's getting pretty wild, isn't it? <laughs> so she put the corn in there and that night the mice went and they went in and they ate all the corn in that dish. And so she was really happy about it because she went and looked in the drawers, no mice. They had eaten out of that dish. So the next night came and she did the same thing. So she said, thank you, Jesus, for getting rid of those mice. And I didn't have to kill them. I did not want to do that. And so <coughs> when then it came the day. And let's see if I can find this right here. And I want you to see this so you understand. Here's the mice. Can you look at that? And it's eating, isn't it, on the floor. It's not in her drawer. See the mouse? See that little mouse? Yeah, it's a mouse. Yeah, it is. It's in the little bag. It is, isn't it? <laughs> and so her prayers were answered, weren't they? So. Then one day, one day, the husband was out in the woods and he was cutting off some of the limbs off the trees for the deer so that they could get to them better. And so she was all alone. Oh, and then at the same time, he was going to go into the store and get some groceries and bring them back. And she was all by herself. And she looked out the kitchen window and here came a big bear. And this thing was just, just lumbering along and lumbering along. And do you see the bear? That's how big it was. It was just a great big bear. And it came, it came and, and it went up to the, to the house. You know, it was just that little cabin. So it wasn't too sturdy, it was pretty old. <coughs> so he came up to the back and he was nosing into the back and she said, oh, I hope he don't, and there was kind of like a dugout basement. She said, I hope he doesn't find that to go to that basement. But that bear was smart and it did go in that and it went down underneath her kitchen and it started coming up through the floor. And she was so scared and she was all by herself. And so she said, she said, dear Jesus, help me, help me. 
because if she would run, the bear would get her faster because bears are fast. And so she said, what should I do? What should I do? And she was praying and praying, and that bear was starting to come right up through the floor. And she happened to look down, and she saw that the mouse trays on the floor. So she, she picked up the mouse trays, and she went, like that, and it scared the bear away. And then she was safe. So see, God can help you, even if it's the big things or the little things. You pray, and he'll help you out and keep you safe. Amen. Okay? You can go back to your seats now. It's now time for our morning prayer. Where everybody is possible, will you please kneel? Our kind Heavenly Father, we humbly bow in your presence. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done for us, for giving us life, for protecting us as we've come here to church to worship. And as we come before you this morning, we have many burdens to bring. You've heard all the prayer requests, and you know just what's needed in each situation. We ask that you will be with and help, heal, and encourage all these folks that are hurting. Be with everyone here today. Bless our pastor and his wife. Bless them. Give him the words to speak as he ministers to us. Be with those who can't be here today. Protect them also. We thank you so much for your supreme sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you too for allowing us to live in this wonderful land that is still has freedom. Be with and bless the Liberty Campaign and help help us to show that we appreciate <coughs> where you allowed us to live. Pour out your Holy Spirit on each of us. Prepare this community for the coming evangelistic series. Yes, sir. Encourage people to question and want to come and learn. Forgive our many sins and our shortcomings. And help us to be shining lights to each and every one that we come in contact with as we go about our daily lives. And thank you now, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And thank you, too, for answering it. For Jesus' sake. And now we have special music, very special. So we'll turn it over to, is it Ami? Mm -hmm. is that, do I, say, I hate to slander people's names. You're good, that's perfect. <laughs> okay.
Amen. Amen. Scripture this morning is found in Jeremy, Jeremiah. Shouldn't use the modern vernacular. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. And their governor shall come. Did I go two pages? Yes, I did. It's amazing how these little thin pages go. Uh, <clears throat> when you search for me with all your heart. Mm. And now we turn the time over to our pastor. Amen. Bonnie. I guess when you've been married for 40 something years, uh, your resolutions stop being about you and they start being about your significant other. I guess it doesn't take 40 years, maybe just 12, because Ami and I have, have kind of been there. And uh, anyhow, I thought that that was an interesting and funny little way to broach. There we go. Uh, to broach uh, our message this morning. I want to thank God for all of you being here, and I want to thank God that I'm here this week, because um, I could have not. Can you, uh, Bobby, can you get the pulpit mic down? Thank you, sir. Hey, thank you, Bobby. I want to acknowledge you in front of everybody uh, that Bobby's doing a fantastic job back there, and we're learning new things and new tricks and things to make sure that uh, we're taking full advantage of the technology that we have in our day and age 
to present the gospel message, and Bobby's been a key part of that. So I want to make sure, I know he doesn't like it, he's about to come over and choke me out right now, but, uh, but I, he signs me, he's like, stop it, but, but, but we do need to acknowledge him. Uh, you know, Bobby's done a lot of great work for us, along with many others in the church, and we need to acknowledge the people that serve the Lord faithfully. That being the case, let me acknowledge the Lord right now and ask for his help as we begin this message this morning. Gracious Father, I thank you uh, that you are indeed gracious. Um, you save us, you help us, you serve us, Lord, um, in very strange ways, despite us. Um, I think everyone this morning can recognize in themselves um, issues and challenges, things in themselves that they see that they need to change or that they'd like to change. And we know that you love us despite us this morning, so we want to acknowledge that. And Father, I ask you now, um, I'm just a man, Lord, and I'm not that tall or that smart or that strong, and so I need your help in presenting anything to your people. And, and we, as your people, recognize, Father, that, that spiritual things are spiritually understood. And so we ask for right now your spirit to be poured out upon us, to work within us, and for us to have the wisdom to apply these things to our lives, and not just to hear them with our ears, that we might be wise unto salvation. I thank you, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, 2018 is in the books, and 2019 is upon us. We are one year closer to the return of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I, I got an amen out of you guys. That is amazing. I can't, I can't tell you how quickly this transition is happening. Pretty soon, you guys are going to be lifting up holy hands to the Lord. Like it says in the book of Peter. That's the literal book of the Bible, by the way. And with the new year comes anticipation and expectations for what the year might bring, right? In your own life, for what you'd like to see happen. Um, and many of us uh, make resolutions to try to accomplish what our expectations are in our life. How many of you made resolutions this year, 2019? Put your hand up nice and high. All right, Levi. So Levi, Levi is the only one. You know what, Levi? God bless you, buddy. You're good. May the, may the Lord empower you to keep your resolution. I think the rest of us are all jaded. You know, we've been there, done that, and we're like, I don't want to be disappointed again. Or a scarier thought is maybe we just don't care. And I don't want to put that on you because I don't know your heart. But I would say that sometimes you just get in a rut and you're like, uh, it's one year to the next. It's a day change, Peter. Calm down. It was the 31st and then it was the first. Are you really going to make a big deal about it? Because it's just like every other month, it's just got a different name. And in Minnesota, it just becomes the Antarctic. But other than that, <laughs> there's really no difference. Um, Great many of Americans, though, do take matters into their own hands every year, though, don't they? And they make resolutions and proclamations using their own hands to shape their own destiny, to bring about their own goals for their own selves. In other words, we make promises to ourselves that we will use all of our willpower to accomplish. And prom promises fulfilled by will uh, willpower are often tricky things, aren't they? Because our willpower is kind of a tricky thing. Have you noticed? Well, this morning we're going to look at what kind of resolutions people make, how successful people's resolutions are, and then offer a resolution solution that is based upon God's resolutions. Notice the title. See what I did there? Based upon God's resolutions to humanity and that are powered by his will and not our will. Sound good? Not really? Fair enough. Well, you're getting it because that's what I've done. So uh, here's some kinds of resolutions that people have made. Can you all see this okay? How do you guys like the new big gigantic screens? Is it working for you? Can everybody in the back see? Are these lights possible to come off? They're not, are they? Yeah. Now I'm just being... I can go through now. Thank you, Roger. So you'll notice here, and I'm going to point my light at it just to demonstrate that it doesn't work. Yep. Statistica.com, which is a website that 
takes all kinds of statistics and they compile them from all different types of polls and different, uh, different demographics and they, they put them up. And so I pulled some resolutions from uh, Statistica to show the various types of resolutions people make. Number one, 37% of people say that they wanna eat healthy in the new year. That's a good thing, right? Especially if you're not eating healthy, bad eating can lead to bad health and bad health leads to unhappiness. And unhappiness need, leads to what? Well, it leads to anger in my heart. I don't know about you guys. When I'm unhappy, I get angry. I get frustrated. And so bad health is a big deal. And, and I understand why people would want to do that. 37% of the people that are polled say that. Uh, get more exercise. 37% say that. Let me just say one thing about Statistica. What, what we're seeing here is don't calculate the total number of percentages because it's going to be like 300 and something. What we have is a smattering of questions that they ask and people can answer more than one. And so it's a, it's a total number out of a, a group of people rather than a total number of questions. Anyhow, I'll think that through later. But 37% of people that were polled along this questioning said that they'd like to get more exercise. They'd like to get their beach body on or maybe your Arctic body up here. For me, that's just putting on more fat so I'm warmer. But, you know, that's everybody's different. So getting more exercise. And getting exercise is a good thing, right? There's nothing wrong with that. 37% say that they want to save more money. How would you like to save a little bit more money? I'm already doing that. I don't have to make that resolution. My wife holds all the credit cards. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about it because I don't know about you guys, but when I got a few extra bucks in my pocket, it's like my leg is on fire and I just got to get it out quick. And so, you know, I don't need to worry about that one. That resolution is accomplished. Thank you, honey, for being responsible. Um, so but that's not a bad thing, is it? To make sure you got a nest egg or something there that you can use your money for that is in an emergency. And some people just really want something, but they don't want to owe anybody for it. And we live in a time when the culture says that if you, if you want something, don't worry about it. There's a fancy little plastic card here with a chip that'll monitor you wherever you go and whatever you buy. Go and whip that out and swipe that and you're good to go for just a few percentage points, like 28%. You can get what you want now and you don't have to worry about it. Why wait when you can have what you want now? Boy, that's the world we live in, isn't it? Instant gratification. 24% hmm. of the people that were polled in this questionnaire said they'd like to get more sleep. How many of you would like more sleep? I want more sleep because it doesn't seem to matter how much more sleep I get, it's not enough sleep. And I think I'm pretty sure I need to hibernate like a bear for a while to get caught up. So it's not a bad thing, right? We're, we're worn down. In American society, we go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, until we just fall over. Many of us are workaholics. Even when we don't need to work, we work because it's become our identity. And that wearing of ourselves down just wears everything down. And friends, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you don't sleep, your mind begins to corrode. It's like a uh, picture a waterway with dirt on the side and you got information flowing through your brain all the time and the, fit, the mental fitness of your brain begins to degrade with the more time that you spend not sleeping until you come to something called psychosis where you're crazy because you're not getting enough sleep and it can happen if you don't get the right kind of sleep for long enough. So say you do three hours a night for a month you know what? You're going to be a little crazy at the end of that month. You might want to grab 12 hours in there somewhere. 18% uh, of the people say that they want to read more. Is there anything wrong with reading more? Does anybody read books here? Oh, I'm, I'm an avid reader. Ellen White talks about, yeah, okay, let me, let me back that up. Let me start this way. You know, before I became a Christian, I was a mess. And I, and I mean, I was a real mess. I, my lifestyle had so corrupted me and so undone my identity, my character, my mental faculties, my physical being, everything about me was broken. And I remember I, I couldn't think straight. I was kind of stuttering when I would talk and my mind would jump from one thing to the next. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't dial it in. And I've got ADHD, you might've noticed. And so, you know, with all of these things compounding with a really negative home environment, I remember I just felt like, I'm not all I can be. And I started to read the Bible. And you know what I noticed? As I started to read the Bible, I felt smarter. And then as I read it more and more, not only did I feel smarter, people began to say, wow, you really like, you're on top of your game. And I started to notice like, you know, 
this is obvious to other people. Maybe I should take a look at this. And you know what Sister White says? She says that the reading of the Bible ennobles the faculties. In other words, it takes the mind and it sharpens it. And the Bible doesn't say something. Iron sharpens iron, right, between people. And so this idea here that the word of God actually builds the mind. So reading more is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, we find that in our day and age, most people don't even read. you know how they get their news? They read the headlines. And they make assumptions about what the entire article says. Or worse yet, what word did I use? Worse, yeah? Worse yet, they watch the nightly news and they think they know something. Friends, don't trust the news. Most of it is fake. And I don't mean just because Donald Trump says it. Because they want to control what it is you think, when you think it, and how you think it. That is basic propaganda informational there. Anyhow, people want to read more. 18%. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good deal, right? So 15% want to make new friends. I think that that's probably a good thing, isn't it? We all need more friends. All of us. And not Facebook friends that you never see and you read about all their intrepid adventures as they go from one thing to the next. They bought their new car. They're on vacation. They're at Chipotle eating a giant burrito that looks like a submarine. Who cares? People want real friends. They want real interactions. And so you see this reflected. I mean, that is... That's a pretty high number. People are lonely in our day and age, and we live in a time when we have more connectivity, or we should. We have more ability to interact, and yet people feel empty, and they want new friends. We're more connected than ever. Where my family lives in California, approximately 3,800 miles away, something like that. I don't do math well, so correct me if I'm wrong, but don't do it now. So my family lives in California. I, I, I can get to my family in five hours on a plane. I'm more connected than ever. And yet, many people find themselves more lonely than ever. And that can even happen in this church. I remember a time when I was in church, and I felt so alone as I saw everybody sitting there. And I think sometimes that can happen here. And so this isn't a bad thing, is it? 15% making new friends. 15% also say they want to learn a new school, a skill, a new school, great. So you want to learn a new skill, that's great. I remember in 2011, we had the uh, Japanese tsunami that came. Do you remember that? Do you remember the footage of that? It was terrible as those waves just crashed into the island and destroyed lives, tore up their property, just divided families. And I remember, I would watch the news footage, and there, there's this one specific time my wife and I were sitting, we we're watching the videos on YouTube, we were enwrapped, it was, it was insane to see this happen. And we saw this helicopter flying above, and there was this long line of people, and the Japanese people were single file in a line, they had their little masks on because breathing that stuff was terrible, and they were standing in line to receive their food handout. Because there was no food, and the government was taking care of them. And it stuck in my mind. I thought to myself, what happens if that happens in America? Are we going to be standing in line peaceably and quiet, waiting for the government? No! We're going to have roving bands of thieves and marauders and rapists and all the other evil things that happen. And so I thought to myself, I need to be prepared. And so I started taking some classes. I learned all kinds of things. Land navigation, primitive hunting, primitive skills, trapping. I learned all kinds. I even did whitewater rafting because I thought, man, I might have to cross a river escaping this crazy stuff. I'm going to learn how to whitewater raft. And I want to tell you something. I don't like water. <laughs> I grew up in California, and I know there's great white sharks in the bay that was right there. So I was not a big fan of water. And now I got in a tiny little boat that I'm strapped into that generally flips over whether you want to or not. And so I started thinking, I need to get more skilled. I need to learn something. I need to increase my capacity and my ability to take care of my family and my friends and those around me. And it's not a bad thing, is it? Get a new job. 14% say they want a new job. How many of you want a new job? You do? You've got a job already? What are you doing, cleaning the toilets? Oh, he's like, I do. Just kidding. <laughs> he just wants a job. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> I got a car that needs detailing. I'll hook you up. We'll get you set up. So, you guys are all happy with your jobs? Okay, fair enough. 14% of people say they want to get a new job. I know some days I feel like I want a new job. 
Don't read into that too much. <laughs> it's not you. It's me. I promise. How many times have you heard that? 13% of people say they want to do a new hobby. You know, people are bored. You know, people have holes in their heart, and so nothing ever satisfies. Did you notice that? That you get what you want, you've been waiting on it a long time, you get it, and then you're like, yes, I have it, and then you're using it. I remember this when I was a kid. Um, I, I wanted a Nintendo. Does anybody remember a Nintendo? Like the very first Nintendo, it was a little square brick, and you had the cartridges, and you'd go and blow on it, then you'd slam it down and hope it would work because it generally didn't. Clearly none of you ever had a Nintendo, but okay. Okay, so you did, all right. So, I remember I wanted that desperately, and it was like three years of begging my parents, please, oh please, I want a Nintendo. Get out of my face, will you just go away? Finally, one day, uh, one Christmas day, I got up in the morning and I opened up a package, and guess what was inside of the package? You guessed it, it was a Nintendo. And I was all kinds of excited. You know how long I played that thing until I was like, okay, I'm done, I'm going outside? Three hours. Three hours, and then it was like, okay, I'm gonna go ride my bike. My parents were so upset. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I played that thing, but it was like, I got it, now what? And, and many of us do that in our lives, and so I can see why this is there. A new hobby, something to keep us occupied, something to give us meaning, something to help us have purpose, something enjoyable, but did you know something? Did you notice something here at all that is obviously missing? Conspicuously absent. Read the Bible. Not a single thing that feeds the spiritual is there. And this is a part of our myopic culture that is so focused on us and our needs, we don't think past today. What does Jesus say? What if you gain the whole world? But then you lose your soul. And this is our culture. Many of us tackle all these external problems, and we do it in our own power. We step up to the plate, and we say, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore this next year. And then three weeks later, guess what? You're not only doing it, but you're doing it double. And it's having no effect on your life. These resolutions are all what I would call common in their focus. There's absolutely no spiritual focus, nothing to feed the inner man or woman and to help them to be more spiritual and character focused at all. This is just about solving an external problem or an internal problem of loneliness. It reveals our culture, which has very little thought for eternity. Very little. A truly problematic way to live, I would say. Well, let's see how successful people are fulfilling these New Year's resolutions, because that's the key, isn't it? If we're going to make them, I'd like to see how successful we are. Well, according to Forbes magazine, which is only a magazine dedicated to the most successful and rich people in the entire world. So you're talking, it does bio, bios of like Bill Gates and such like that, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, you know, the people that you go, wow, those guys are super rich. So they know a little something about successfulness, and they did this poll, and it says that only 8% of people that actually do New Year's resolutions succeed. 8%, that means 92 of us crash and burn on resolutions that are as simple as I would like to eat healthy, or as simple as I'd like to start a new hobby, or as I'd like to make a friend. There's literally 7 billion people in the world, and people are not able to accomplish making a new friend in a new year. Do you know what that says? That says there are some serious roadblocks to us accomplishing our heart's desire. Not only do only 8% 8 8 of people succeed each year, but according to Business Insider, which is kind of like a Forbes knockoff magazine, it also deals with the rich companies and how they actually succeed in what they're doing, leadership training, such. 80% of all people who actually tackle them fail by February. So that means not even one month of willpower is exercised to their good before they fail. Those are terrible statistics. That's worse than a flu shot. I'd encourage you to get a flu shot quicker than I would for you to make a New Year's resolution because I don't want to see you fail. So as you can see, the numbers are pretty bleak. What happens when you fail to keep promises to yourself? What happens? What do you think? 
your self-esteem, right? Well, basically, you stop making them. You stop having confidence in yourself. You stop thinking that you're worth very much. Because if you can't even keep your promises to your own self, why in the world would you want to make them to somebody else? And as a matter of fact, what happens is, in that same Statistica uh, resolution poll here, it says that 32% of people don't even make them any longer. So we have seen that people make common but important promises. Nothing wrong with those promises, are there? I mean, would you say those are sinful? No, those are, those, are, those are basic to humanity, and we should have those things. We should be doing all those things. Maybe not getting a new job, Peter. I should just mellow out there. But um, I think those are important promises to make, but more often than not, people fail at them. And don't just fail, but they fail miserably, which then can cause you to become jaded can be cause you to, to look at yourself as if you're not worth very much. And do you know what happens when you don't think very much of yourself? You don't do very much for yourself. Because you say, why? I'm not worth it. I'm worthless. I remember growing up, I would make a mistake and my dad would say to me, and he, he didn't mean to. My dad was not a Christian. He'd tell me, you're worthless. You're worthless piece of toy stuff. You're worthless. And you know what? After a while, I started to think, you know, I'm worthless. What do you expect? And I would yell that back at him as he yelled that at me. I'd say, I'm worthless. Why do you even care? Why are you saying it to me? It's a terrible thing, right? But it's worse when you do it to yourself in your own mind. Do you ever curse yourself? You ever do something stupid and you're like, what an idiot. Oh my, what a dummy. How am I like this? Listen, I'm so dumb. Have you done that to yourself? Yeah, most of us have. I want to tell you something. The enemy loves that. Because when you see yourself as worthless, then you don't see yourself from the perspective of God. And when you don't see yourself from the perspective of God, you are weak and therefore controllable. And if you are therefore controllable, then you belong to him and you don't belong to God. And the enemy would like nothing more than to keep you in a tiny little hole where he can walk by and kick you every time he wants to. Just saying. So the resolution phenomena here, the, the lack of success and the various things that we talk about, brings to light several questions in my mind. Number one, should we even make promises at all? And I think that's a good question based upon our understanding here from this poll. And this is very common, by the way. Almost all the polls I look like, looked at and all the various statistics I look like pretty much so, show the same thing. So should we even make promises at all? What about God's promises, and what should I focus on this year? What should be the thing I should most focus on? Well, let's deal with should I make promises. Well, based upon my understanding of Scripture and my understanding of human nature, first my own and then yours, because I've noticed that people are kind of alike. Have you gotten that? Have you noticed that most people are the same? They just look a little different, but they do all the similar stuff, and we all bleed the same red in there, right? So based upon that, I would say we probably shouldn't make promises very often, and we should be doing them very specifically, at least not without being born again. Listen to what Sister White says in Ministry of Healing, page 179.4. It says, the good resolutions made in one's own strength avail you nothing. In other words, they're pointless. She says this, not all the pledges in the world will break the power of one evil habit. In other words, your willpower isn't enough to get the job done. Never will men practice self-control in all things until their hearts are right, renewed by divine grace. Listen to that. Ellen White talking about grace. I hope that flips some of your understanding on their head. We cannot keep ourselves from sin for one moment. Listen to that. That's Ellen White, guys. That's, that's not the Mrs. Perfect, get yourself together. That's Sister White telling you that you can't do this without Jesus. We cannot keep ourselves from sin for one moment. Every moment we are dependent upon God. Therefore, I would say, because of our sin nature, we need to be extremely careful with our promises, with our oaths, with our swearing, which is why James says, 
But of all, above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into what? Judgment. What is swearing? Don't you dare say cussing. <laughs> what is it to swear? It's to make a promise. But you make a promise not based upon you, well, maybe upon you, but upon something greater than you is what, how it normally goes. So you say, I swear to G. Have you heard that? People try to tell you something and they really want you to believe it. You know they're lying. Maybe you've been fishing with somebody and they're like, yeah, I caught this whopper. Check this thing out. And you're like, yeah, right. And they go, I swear to G. That's a promise that you're doing something or saying something in a specific manner which supports your conclusions. Here James says, but above all, listen to that, but above all, how serious is that? But above all, James says in his writings. James is very practical. James is like the book of Proverbs in the New Testament. Very practical information. He says, listen, don't make oaths. Don't swear. Don't make promises, especially not by heaven or by any other oath or earth. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know what? Sometimes, friends, you got to tell people no. Man, I want to do a lot of good for people all the time. But I've come to the point where I know that even though my spirit is willing, my flesh is weak. And so in my mind, when somebody asks me to do something, I really have a war inside because I want to do that good thing for them, but I know I've been prone to failure in the past. And so I'll tell people I'm not sure and I don't want to make you a promise. Friends, sometimes you just got to tell somebody, no, I can't. Or if you can and you know you can, you know you will by God's grace, then say yes. But don't start making promises to people. Hmm. So because of our sinful nature, I would say based upon this, that this might be a bit extreme to some people, and so we're going to need some further clarification. Does God really not want me to make promises? I'd like to get you to open up your Bible. I hope you have your Bibles with you. You can have your phone. That's okay. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount. He's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he's essentially flipping the entire Jewish mindset on its head. He said to them, the poor, right, the poor shall have the kingdom. And at the people at that time were thinking, wait a minute, the poor are cursed of God. That's why they're poor, because God doesn't love them. Jesus goes on to say, the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek are the people that get walked on. How are they going to inherit the earth? Shouldn't the righteous, at least in their mind? He says, the thirsty shall be filled. Well, why do they need filling, the Jews would say. What's wrong with them? And Jesus flips their entire thinking on their head over and over and over. Reread this. And consider this in your mind when you read this, that this is everything that is said. Jesus says, you've heard it said, you have heard it said, you have heard it said over and over. And we're going to see that again in verse 33. Look here, he says, verse 33, chapter 5 of Matthew. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. Who is he speaking to here? Well, he's speaking about the, the Israelites during the time of Moses and even up until his day, he says, you've heard that it was said. Do you remember Jesus talked about divorce in Matthew chapter 22? Do you recall this? And he said, Moses allowed you to do something because of the hardness of your heart. In other words, you could write a certificate of divorce for any reason you wanted to. Your wife didn't cook very well. You showed up and she didn't have your hay bed flattened out. You could say, you know what? You're out of here. Gone. And the male was allowed to do that in their culture. And Jesus says, that's not how it was. <laughs> Lisa looked over Dave's like, you do that, you're out of here. <laughs> so, okay, you have heard. So here he is flipping it on his head again. He says, you've heard this before. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. In other words, at the, in the time Leading up to Jesus, and even during the time of Moses, if you're going to swear on something, you must keep your oaths. You could be stoned to death for violating your oaths before two or three witnesses. That's a serious charge, right? And so Moses said, look, to keep you from being deceitful and lying to God and lying to others, listen, if you're going to swear, at least keep your oaths because there is a consequence. Jesus says, you've heard this said, but then he goes on to say in verse 34, but I say to you... Do not swear at all. Don't make promises at all. Don't do it. 
Then he goes on to say, neither by heaven. So in other words, don't swear by heaven. Why? Because heaven doesn't belong to you. That's God's. He owns it all. He says, neither by earth. Why? Because earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne. So both of these things aren't yours. Don't swear by it. Then he goes on to say, neither by Jerusalem. This was a big deal in their time. People would swear, particularly the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they would say, listen, I swear to you on the gold of the temple, or I swear to you on the city of Jerusalem. It, was, it gave them weight so that people would believe their promises to them. Jesus says, don't you dare do that. Because Jerusalem is the city of the great king. It is his city. Verse 36, he says, Nor shall you swear by your own head. Why? Because you cannot make one hair white or black. In other words, you don't belong to you. You were bought with a price. Now, the world's going to do all kinds of crazy things. But you all are sitting in this church. And so my assumption is you believe in the Lord Jesus. Is that right? Is that a fair assessment? So then, therefore, this applies to you where it might not apply to the world because they don't care about God anyways. They think they're their own. Satan thinks he's his own. He says, why do I got to keep a law? I'm an angel. I'm good. I belong to me. I'll monitor my life. But as Christians, we come to God. We belong to Jesus. We were bought with the price of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He lived for us. He died for us. He rose for us. He ascended to heaven for us. And he's now there right now, standing between us and judgment, because you know what? Even as Christians, we still sin. We still mess up. And God says, no, they're mine. So therefore, if we truly believe in God, he says, don't even make promises on your own self. Instead, look at what he goes on to say. He says, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Why? For whatever is more than these is from who? The evil one. That is a very important point. How is this from the evil one? Number one, we've kind of talked about this already. You already, you know how weak you are. And you failed yourself before. And you know what it does to your psyche to fail and to fail and to fail. It breaks you, doesn't it? Now, some of you are young and you haven't been there yet and you're invincible and you're strong and you're wise and you're all the things that everybody's going to show you later. Like, yeah, see, told you you weren't. But for right now, you are. And that's great. Work on it. But keep in mind that life is difficult and in ourselves, we do not have the internal power to resist the things that we must resist in order to always be successful. It's a fight. Jesus says, if when you start making promises like this, it's through the whispering of the enemy. Have you ever seen the old Tom and Jerry cartoons? You seen that before? Where, where on Jerry, there's the little angel that pops up and he's like, don't eat him. Don't eat Jerry. And then on the other side, there's the devil that says, eat him quick. Hurry up, get him. And there's this battle. Well, there's some truth to that in the sense that the enemy's always whispering at us trying to get us to violate our conscience, trying to get us to do one thing or another. And the angels are there as God's appointed agencies to help protect you and to take care of you. And the enemy wants you to be making promises, and then he wants to try to trip you up along the way so that you hate yourself. I heard uh, Roger this morning talk about a young man that was curled up in a ball in his room for months because of depression. I came to a point in my walk with God very early on where I saw myself for who I really was. And it caused me to go into deep, deep depression. I didn't leave my room for eight months. And I had to be in God's word all the time because it had to be reminded that I was more than what I thought I was. And I needed to know that God loved me despite me. The enemy does not want you to have that. He wants you to be down there. And then once you're down there, he's the one that puts you down there. Then he laughs and he stomps you the whole time. He's the lowest of the low. So he wants you to fail. But then worse than that, as a Christian, he wants you to start making promises presumptuously. You stand in the place of God and you say, don't worry, I've got this. And God says, since when? Since when do you have it? Because I've carried you the whole way. Doesn't the Bible say in John chapter 15 that without me, you can do nothing. But with me, you shall bear much fruit. 
He says, I am the, van the vine, you are the branches. This is a clear biblical principle, and the enemy wants you to violate this. Listen to what James says in the next verse here. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and a spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. In other words, he says, look at what you're doing. You're making plans all on your own about your life. All for you. I'm going to go there. I'm going to spend a year there. I'm going to make money. And God's saying, really? Is that our plan? Is that my plan for your life? You see, James is talking to Christians. The Bible isn't for unbelievers, friends. Get that in your head. That's the law's part. The Bible is written for us. It says that very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, these things were written for our example who have come down to the end of the ages. So the word of God is speaking to Christians. Speaking to you. It's speaking to me. And it says here, for you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Friends, in other words, your breath isn't guaranteed. You don't know if you're going to wake up. You don't know if you're going to walk out this door and get hit by a car. God forbid. You don't know. You have no control even if you didn't know because those things are not within your power. And James puts these things in contrast to another. He says, listen, you're making plans, but you can't even determine your next breath. That's a gift of God. I want to tell you something this week. And then two weeks ago, I, I faced some major challenges that brought this home to me. Tuesday morning, two weeks ago, I woke up in the morning, and when, as soon as I got up out of bed, I like started stumbling and staggering. The whole world started spinning on me. And I got up to go to the bathroom, and I was like a drunkard. I was just staggering from one side of the house to the other, trying to get to the bathroom to use the bathroom. And I felt in my spirit, the Lord said to me, you need to go to the hospital. But I thought to myself, because you know I'm God in my mind, I thought to myself, I, I'm good, God, don't worry, I'm just going to lay down. And I said that facetiously, because some of you started to look at me a little crazy there. I'm not God. But you know how we act. Sometimes we're like, move over, God, I, I can share the throne with you. So I'm here thinking to myself, it's just, maybe something's weird. Maybe I just, you know, my little ear infection. I'm just going to lay down. I spent the day working out of my bed. But every time I would move, the whole world would spin. Those of you that have drunk alcohol before, don't put your hands up. Uh, know that when you get to a certain point, it's, it's the most miserable feeling of the world. You get what's called the spins. And the spins are death. They're terrible. It's a, it's a miserable feeling. It's enough to get you to start making promises to God that you'll never do it again. So I'm there and I'm, I'm just spinning. It's terrible. I feel nauseous. I can't see straight. My eyes are all fuzzy. I got through a whole night like this. I got up the next morning. As soon as I got out of bed, I started staggering again, staggering in the bathroom. And the Lord said, you need to go to the hospital. And this time I said, Lord, I'm going to the hospital. And I came out and I told Ami. I said, Ami, I need to go to the hospital. She said, you want me to make an appointment to the doctor? I said, no, I need to go to the hospital. I got to the hospital. They started running all these tests on me. CAT scan of my brain. Um, he started doing these tests, and I don't know if any of you are medical professionals or not, but there's these tests that they can do to determine whether or not you're either having a heart problem or you're going to have a stroke, and it's like a push-pull thing that they do with your hands. And so this, this doctor is smaller than me, so I knew I was stronger than him in my mind, but he was, he's like, put your hands out here, and he said, resist me, and I started to resist him, and my left arm was like a rock. It was like it's like Samson, but my right arm just kind of eh, started to drift away. And his eyes, I could see his eyes lit up and he started to get a little worried. He said, do me a favor. I want you to take your leg and I want you to just gently run your heel down the front of your shin. And I did that fine with my left side. But when I got to my right, I could barely lift it up and I drug it all over the back side of my leg. He said, OK, we need to get you into the MRI. And there they put me in this machine that when you stick your whole head in, it feels like they're putting you in a coffin. It's a terrible feeling if you've ever had an MRI. But they, they put something over your face, and there's a machine right here, and you're blindfolded. And they put this headphones on, and country music was blaring, which was already hell for me because I don't listen to that. And so um, I'm there, and I'm, and I'm starting to hyperventilate. And they put me inside and it goes, and it does this really weird sound. And I, I'm there and I'm scared. I'm going like, this is, this is not normal. 
And I get back into my room, and the doctor comes in, and he says, listen, and he's, he's, the whole demeanor has changed. Because when he came in, he said, look, we're just going to start with the serious stuff, and we'll work our de- way down to the smaller stuff. He comes in, he says, listen, you have, a, you have a tear in one of your arteries that runs to your brain. So essentially, I had blood that was starting to build up to the point where I was on the verge of a stroke. Now, I don't know if you know this about strokes, but strokes are silent killers. Not only are they silent killers, they're silent wreckers of the body and the mind. In other words, people that have strokes sometimes never fully recover. One side of their body either becomes paralyzed or they can become fully paralyzed. Sometimes they lose the ability to talk. Sometimes they lose the ability to remember. The point here is that in that moment, I realized, wow, God, I could be, if I wouldn't have come in right now, I might not be the same me. My brain power would have been turned way down, and that's a problem because it's already low as it begins with. So here's my point. I started to think, Lord, I I don't really have any control over my life, do I? Not when it comes to that. You don't know the next breath you're going to take. How can you make promises for tomorrow? You can barely even accomplish today. That's why Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow's trouble because you have enough of it today. And then (laughs) Tuesday, I was on my way up here to come to the prayer meeting with the brethren. And I was excited. We're going to eat Pizza Ranch. And I started to like that place. So I was on my way. And I'm driving along. And we need to do a pit stop over at Walmart. And I'm I'm driving through. Back through there. I got a green light. Nobody's around. And suddenly somebody's right in front of me. And I T-bone them. And I thought to myself, good God, help me. The enemy's trying to kill me. What is my point with all this? My point is, is that our oaths and swearing and promises, they presume the idea that we both have the ability to carry them out and that we'll be here to do so. God says this. Through James, he says, what is your life? What is it? Measure it. He says, you were created out of dust in my breath. What is your life? He says, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. This is the sin condition, isn't it? That we live for a bit and then we die. Though the enemy doesn't want us to believe that, you won't surely die. Our society wouldn't want us to believe that. Why? Because they're trying to get all this artificial intelligence and this biomedical, mechanical, cyborg stuff happening where... People like Elon Musk say, listen, the time is coming where you just take the chip in your brain and you'll be smarter. We can upload your whole consciousness to digital, like like a hard drive. You can live forever. That's what the world is telling us. That's what everything in our society tells us. Listen, don't worry about tomorrow. You're going to be fine. Get what you want now. Eat how you want now. Live how you want now. Talk how you want now. Do what thou wilt. You know where that comes from? Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley was the world's leading Satanist that comes straight from the devil. And the whole thing is built into our society the way that we think. It's even built into the way that we celebrate New Year's. The the starting of a new year is the year that we begin to change ourselves. You know what else happens on New Year? When the ball drops, you grab a random uh, stranger and you give him a big old fat kiss. Should we do that one too? I don't think we should. This one is explicit in scripture. Listen to what it says. Instead of making promises about what you're going to be doing and how you're going to do it, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. In other words, we shouldn't make promises, but we should lay out expectations based upon God's will. That if we are going to tell ourselves we're going to do this, that, or the other thing, we should have consulted the Lord and asked him what he wants for us. Now, I know that's hard for you all to do. Why Why do I know that? Because you all want to do what you want to do. Am I right? You want to do what you want to do. That's just the truth of the matter. And so this runs exactly against the grain of human nature. And you have got to choose God. What do you want for me today? Listen to what he says. 
But now you boast in your arrogance. In other words, when you make these sort of promises, you're boasting in your arrogance. Who are you? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You were bought with the life of the king. The king of kings. The Lord of lords. What right do you have to sit here and dictate to God what your life is going to look like? You see, this is the problem with sin, friends. It's insane. Because we stand here and we justify our right to tell God how we're going to live our life, which we ought not even to have, because the wages of sin is death, and we deserve it, and you know it yourself. We know it that there's something wrong inside of us, and yet God says, I love you. Please come unto me. I will direct your paths, the word says. I will direct your steps. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is what? Say it real loud with me. And is evil sin? Yeah. In other words, we could say sinful. So when we make promises and claims about the actions that we plan to take tomorrow without consulting the Lord, we're basically setting ourselves up as God. So that then we can conclude, based upon our first question, that promises are extremely limited according to the word of God. Accepting, now let me make this really clear, accepting oaths that you make to God. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this, is that when you tell God you want to do something, the assumption is and the implication is, is that you do it by his power. Have you ever told God, I'm never going to do that again? That ever happened to you? Come on, friends. You got your secret sin. You know the one, right? How many times have you told God, I'm never going to do that again? But did you notice that when you overcome that sin, it's not because you told God something, it's because you asked God to do something. You didn't tell God, I'm going to do it. You said, God, do it. Do it in my life. I can't. This is a key point. So if we're going to make promises, they need to be based first and foremost upon consultation with the Lord and then upon direction of his will for our lives. We move to the next section. What about God's promises? Let's ask that question. We've seen there's a limited place, but let's see. Um, according to the Bible, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, if you have a promise you're going to make to yourself, what are you essentially saying? Especially a New Year's resolution. You're saying, look, I need this, right? I want this. I should have this. I should be this, and I'm not this. Let me be this. So what you're actually asking for is for a change in your life in some form or another, whether materially, physically, spiritually, emotionally, whatever the case is, you're asking for a change. And the Bible says God will give you everything that you need if you are just willing to first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's a promise, friends. That is one heck of a promise right there. Where you just say, oh God, I care more about your people than I'm going to care about my circumstances. Oh God, I care more about your righteousness than I care about my needs. I want you in my life. And then he will do all that he wants you to do. All that you need will be met. Friends, I, I want you to know, I'm not missing anything with God in my life. And even if I'm not up to the par that I think I should be, listen, you're always going to look terrible standing next to Jesus. Always. So when I was a kid, I was short, and there was all these athletic, big, strong guys. I'm never going to look good compared to them. That's okay when you stand next to Jesus because nobody looks good standing next to him because he's amazing. Amen. So my question here today to you is, is why are we making promises to ourselves to do something that God already wants to do for us. Not only does he want to, but God has the power to carry it out. When God says, I will do it, does he do it? Boy, you guys seem confused about that. Does God not accomplish his will? You bet he does. He accomplishes it double, more than you can even hope or imagine, the Bible says. I want you to listen to the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was a contemporary of Ellen White. He lived out in, uh, in London area and in England, and he preached from there at the same time period as Ellen White and the pioneers of our church were formulating the Seventh-day Adventist church. So when you read him, you're going to hear a lot of 
sort of similarities because they were spiritual people at the same time. As a matter of fact, I have nine volumes of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I'm talking like books like this of his sermons, and they are so inspiring. I haven't read one sermon of his where I thought to myself, wow, this guy is so off base. Every one of them is potent. Listen to what he says. He says, I have thumbed through my Bible many a year, and I have never yet thumbed a broken promise. Amen. I can say myself, I have lived on one promise for weeks, and I want no other. I just want simply to hammer that promise in gold leaf and to plate my whole existence on it. Friends, I want to tell you something. One promise of God can sustain you when every resource of the world will fail you. There was a time in my walk with God where I came under intense persecution, and I mean intense persecution, where my life and my soul were at stake. And I remember in that moment, my mind would not think of any. I tried to, tried to think of all the promises of the Bible. I tried to, tried to hang on to God. But in the midst of persecution, your knees are quaking. Your mind is shaking. Your heart is quailing. All things are going on. You know what came into my mind? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I hung on to that promise and I kept repeating it over and over and over in my mind. And you know what happened? He never left me nor forsook me. I stood in the middle of that persecution, that death-defying moment in my life. And I came out more than a conqueror, not through me, but through the promise God gave me. He carried me. God never gives his children a promise, this is Charles Haddon Spurgeon, which he does not intend for them to use. There are some promises in the Bible, he says, which I have never yet used, but I am well assured that there will come times of trial and trouble when I shall find that that poor despised promise, which I thought I would never use, will be the only one that sustains me in my trial. Glory to God. So how many promises are in the Bible? Well, this is an amazing statistic. 8,810 total promises out of 31,101 verses. In other words, 28% of the Bible is a promise. You think there's a promise in there for you? You ever wonder if one of those might be specifically for you? You think you might have more than one? You think God might have a promise to you that might meet your need? You think God might have a promise to you to help you with what you need this upcoming year? You bet your life on it. God's got 8,810 of them, according to Dr. Everett Storm, who studied this for many, many years. You want to you wanna go to a chapter of the Bible that is just packed full of, of Bible promises? Read Psalm 37. Every verse is a mighty promise to you. That chapter will sustain you when nothing else will. Because God has spoken to you in his word. All right, let me start moving on here. I know I'm starting to see the restlessness. So about another half an hour and we're going to be ready to go. All right. So what should I focus on this year? I, I'd like you to open up your Bible to Romans chapter 13. I want you to know, friends, that the Bible is the very word of God. And it is according to itself and according to the lives that has changed over thousands and thousands of years, the living word of God. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's God's word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this here. We're going to go to Romans chapter 13. We're going to look at 11 and 12. And this is what I want to focus on this new year. And this is what I hope you want to focus on this new year. Romans chapter 13, 11 and 12. 13, 11 and 12 in Romans. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. All right. Paul says, and do this, knowing the time. What time? The end times. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Friends, 2018 is gone. We are one year closer to the return of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. 
Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I am convinced, friends, that Jesus is coming. As I watch world events and I look at all the metrics to look at, to measure where we're at, not only in time, but morally, economically, socially, politically, all of these different things, geopolitically, internationally, all these different metrics or these, these measures by which we rate and determine things are pointing. They're saying, I am coming. And we need to wake up. The Seventh Adventist Church has slept long enough, friends. We have slept long enough. All ten virgins slept. Did you know that? Matthew 25. All ten slept. It's okay. You're not condemned for your sleeping. We need to start getting some oil in that lamp. And it needs to stay there. It needs to stay lit. It needs to stay burning. And we need to get about the business of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to get about the business of our Father, and we need the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I believe that with all of my heart. We cannot afford to play games anymore. These half-truths, I don't know about you, I'm tired of playing church. You know when I put my hand up and I said, I'd like a new job? That's why I don't, that's why I don't want to be a pastor sometimes. I'm just being honest. Is that okay? I think honesty is like always the best thing. It's not you. I'm not, I'm not saying it's you, but sometimes I just think we're just going through the motions up here. We're just faking it entirely. And we think somehow because we come in here and we sing a few songs to God, we read a Bible verse, we tell a children's story, somehow God is up there going, wow, they really love me. <laughs> He's not. Let's be honest. Half the time we're half asleep. We're singing the songs like we're singing a, a funeral dirge. We're not singing for him. We're singing for us. Nine times out of ten. I'm not saying everybody's motive. Don't get me wrong. I'm not accusing anybody of anything individually. But I, I just, I've seen it too long. I'm tired of it. I want to go home. I want to look like the book of Acts. I want to love one another. I want to walk through life together. I want to tackle all the challenges of this life with you. And if we don't get that mentality in our mind, I want to tell you something. You will not stand in the last days if you don't start standing in these days. It's impossible. What, you think, <laughs> you think you're going to rise to the occasion to overcome the entire might of the world and all of the demonic hosts? You aren't going to do that in those last days if you can't even do it today. We need Jesus because we can't do it any day without him. What should I focus on this new year? I'd encourage you to focus on these verses. And behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to his work. And there's more. There's more. There's so many verses that not only tell us that, but just look around. What do you see out there? You see people becoming more brotherly, more loving, more kind, more unity, more cooperation. You see that happening? We should be alarmed. But instead we're so focused on ourselves. We don't care about that. To be honest, half of us couldn't even name where some of these problems are happening on a map. And it says it. We'll miss it. It's scary, friends, that we are at this point in history and we are so asleep. I want to encourage you, wake up. Wake up. Because you can't stand on your own. I want to tell you something. When they start coming to threaten your freedoms and they say, listen, bow. Bow or I'm going to hurt your family. Bow or I'm going to take away your food. Bow or I'm going to control you eternally. Many of us are going to say, oh, okay, okay, never mind. I don't believe in Jesus. And we're going to give it up like so many others in the past. It happened in World War II, friends, with one little man with a mustache. He made so many Christians give up their faith. And that was a drop in the bucket to what we're going to be facing. We need to get with it. We need to get with it today. And we can't wait another day. What am I saying to do here? I'm saying we got to start focusing on Jesus. we got to get our relationship with him right. How do you do that? By changing all your behaviors and things? No. Bad way to start. Go to God. He knows your weaknesses. Not only that, he knows you. 
You want somebody who knows you, the real you. I don't know you. You know you, and he knows you, but he knows you better than you, and so he can meet the needs of your heart and your mind and what you seem to perceive as a need in your life. We need God this year. We don't need him last year. We don't need him next year. We need him this year. We need him right now. We can't wait another minute because you don't know when your probation is going to close. Because today could be your last breath, God forbid. Nobody has control of that. Nobody knows the day or the hour. And I don't want to see you lost. More importantly, I don't want to walk. I don't want to just come here once a week and pretend like we're like the greatest church on earth. I don't. I think it's faking, it's disingenuous, and I think it's a shame to the world that we're God's remnant church and we can only dedicate four hours a week to each other. I think that's shameful, personally. That's me. That's my personal opinion. And, and I don't think that there's, there's anything wrong with where you're at. I just think that maybe we need to start focusing on what we're going to do with our life as Christians and, and with each other as a church. Because if, you, if all you can give God is three hours a week, I'm pretty certain you're not going to be able to give him everything before the last day when the trouble hits. And more importantly, I, kinda, I feel like God. I feel like him. I feel like if we're not going to do this with fire in our hearts, it makes me want to throw up. I get discouraged. I, hate, I, I admit it. I do. I get discouraged. I go home. I go like, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Boy, I say that to him at least once a week. I don't want to do this. I understand why the prophets weep. I understand why they went around crying and say, let me die. I get it. It doesn't mean it's right. I just get it. And I'm saying to you all, this is a year we can be so much more. We can do so much more. God wants to do all those miracles. He can do them. We've all heard the stories. When is the story going to be ours? When is this place going to have a mighty rushing wind blow those doors open and flames of fire are going to come sweeping over each one of us? When am I going to see us stand and look like the word of God says we ought to be? You want to know when? When we all decide to, because nothing's holding God back. It's our choice. And this year can be your choice. So make your resolutions if you need to. But I'd encourage you to counsel God. Levi, I don't mean nothing to you, buddy. You made resolutions, go for it. Ask God to help you with them, bud. He's got your back. The point here is that this year, Jesus is coming. There is a movement within our church right now that is grassroots, that is rising up, that is calling people to faithfulness because they see the signs that maybe we've missed as a corporate body. Because we're too busy focusing on things like women's ordination and whether or not certain schools are teaching evolution and all this other garbage that the enemy is setting our path. He wants us distracted. He wants you broken. He wants you idle. He wants you thinking about your bills and all your different challenges in life and why people don't like you. And all. Listen, people are never going to like you. Not in this world. They're going to hate you if you're going to walk with God. we got to get past all that and say, Lord, I'm, a, I'm ready to run the race. Amen. Put the race in front. Put my Air Jerusalem on. I'm ready to run. hope y'all hear me. This isn't a challenge to you that I'm saying that you all are broken. I'm not because we all know we're all broken. So it's not a matter of me standing up here thinking I'm better. I'm just as bad. I got to apologize to my wife later because this last week I've treated her like garbage because I've been discouraged. I've been questioning whether or not I'm even fit to be doing this sort of work or whether my not my life was even spared for a reason. Sometimes you feel like that, don't you? You just feel like, not that I want to commit suicide. Please don't anybody call Jimmy and have him say, put me on a 72-hour hold or anything. <laughs> I'm good. I'm not, he's not that bad. But sometimes you question, right? You just go, what am I doing? We all got stuff to work on. And the sooner we get to it, the sooner we get over it. Jesus is coming. And he wants to take you home. People say all the time, Jesus could have come. Jesus could have come. Maybe. Maybe he could have. But I want to tell you something. Jesus isn't coming until the last one of us is willing to go home with him. If he's waiting for somebody, he'll wait. He'll wait. He'll wait for you. But let me tell you something. He won't wait forever. Because he is coming. He's going to cut this thing short in righteousness. Because the sin is terrible. 
If he don't come soon, he's going to start having to give Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Because we're looking pretty bad up in here. I have a word of prayer with you all. Actually, we're going to sing. I'm going to do this right this time. I'm going to pray with, for the food. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Got to figure it out. Tell you, a little shame will help you to remember something, huh? <laughs> Let's all stand up. We're going to sing uh, 495, right? Well, this week and this year, keep in mind that it's not you, it's God. And your promises, while they may be important in your life, can all be met by God. You don't have a risk of failure. You don't have a risk of presumption. You can keep God on the throne of your life. All you have to do is decide to trust him instead of yourselves. Let me bless you. Glorious Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share this message you've put upon my heart and I know that each of us are stirred, Lord, by the times in which we live. And I would ask you, Father, to give us confidence in your word. In all 31,101 verses, may we always look to those 8,810 8, in our times of need because those are your promises to us to fill us, to strengthen us, to carry us when we can walk no longer. And I pray, Father, that you would bless and keep your people, make your face to shine upon them, and give them peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, each one.